Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of our Lightning Interview Series. As always, we want to make these sessions interesting and interactive. So please do introduce yourself on the chat channel and tell us where you're joining from and what you do. And of course, please feel free to add your converse, your questions to this conversation. So our guest today is the highly regarded professor and legal scholar, Mark Lemley, and we'll be diving into the topic of generative AI and the law. So first, I want to give you um, an update on a, our main event of the second half of this year, and that is ODSC West. We're back in the heart of Silicon Valley, right there in Bullingame. That'll begin on October 30th. It's basically a four-day hands-on training conference. And we are announcing our first 50 sessions next week. So if you want to get your hands on some hands-on training in generative AI, fine-tuning and training LLMs, prompt engineering, and of course, machine learning, deep learning, NLP, you definitely want to check that out. So for today's interview, I just want to provide some quick background. So as you probably know, generative AI involves the use of machine learning techniques to create new content. It learns from large data sets to understand patterns and relationships which allow it to mimic the data it was trained on. This enables it, of course, to create new content like programming code, text, images, or videos that allows the patterns it learns to offer a way to generate realistic and contextually relevant outputs. This AI finds application in programming arts and, of course, content creation. Now, large language models, or as we know them, LLMs, exemplified by Falcon GPT-4, and more recently, I think it was uh, two, at least three weeks now, uh, Llama 2, are a prominent subset of generative AI that specialize in generating human-like text by predicting the next sequence of words based on the input they receive. And it's not an understatement to say that generative AI's impact on intellectual property and copyright is pretty profound, raising questions about the ownership and originality of AI-generated creations. Since the content is autonomously generated, there are liability and responsibility questions on who holds legal responsibility, developers, AI experts, users, or Gen AI itself. Additionally, since generative AI blurs the lines between replication and innovation, it raises questions about fair use and transformative use, as well as privacy and data production concerns. So joining us today to help us understand these many questions and more is a very prominent legal scholar with an incredibly distinguished career. Professor Mark Lemley is a leading scholar and practitioner in the field of intellectual property law and teaches at Stanford Law School, where his courses include patent law, trademark law, and the law of robotics and AI. He's also the director of the Stanford Program in Law, Science, and Technology, and a senior fellow in the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Very relevant to this conversation, Mark is one of the most cited scholars in IP law, and his works have been cited more than 300 times by courts, and he has published many books and articles in IP and antitrust law. In addition to his academic work, Mark is an active litigator in the field of IP. He has argued 30 federal cases and numerous dis district court cases, and he has participated in more than three dozen cases in front of the United States Supreme Court. Mark is also a frequent speaker and lecturer in IP law and has been recognized for his work and received numerous awards. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. So Mark, um, we have a lot to uncover here. Very impressive resume. Congratulations on your career. A lot I left out there. So I encourage each of you, um, we're going to show share Mark's um, Stanford um, homepage and you can check out his background. Uh, it's pretty extensive. But let's get into today's topic and help us understand the landscape we're operating here. Can you give us a quick breakdown of the current state of copyright law here in the U.S.? So that's a, you know, we, we teach whole classes on that, but I'll, I'll give you the, the short version. Uh, copyright law, as its name suggests, is primarily, although not exclusively, directed with cop, uh, at, at copying. Um, if you uh, create something, and that something could be a literary work, it could be art, uh, video, but it could also be computer code, uh, you can relatively easily um, uh, own the rights to prevent others from copying it or performing it publicly. Uh, for a very long time, uh, the, your, your, your life plus 70 years. Um, right. And one of the things that means is that virtually everything uh, that most AIs encounter is copyrighted material. Uh, unless you're training a history data set on things before 1928, uh, you're training on something that somebody has a copyright in most of the time. Um, 
copyright law is also balanced, at least in the United States, by the fair use doctrine, which permits uh, certain uses that are either thought not to interfere with the market or that are sort of socially productive uses. Uh, so we're going to dig into a bunch of those issues, but uh, but that's the that's the rough outline. Excellent. And um, we have a lot of debates uh, with our team around um, LLM, generative AI, and the issues around it. And like everything else, um, it pays to be informed here. So what do you find are in the conversations you're having in, in both the um, university uh, industry and legal context, what are you finding are some of the biggest misconceptions around copyright law in the context of AI and especially generative AI? Yeah, so there are a couple, and they and they point in different directions, right? So let me, uh, you know, on the on the what do what do AI folks know about law side? I think one thing that I would um, uh, flag as a misconception is uh, that it's hard to get a copyright, or that copyright's really just about you know songs that are recorded and released. Uh, the reality of the situation is that everybody on this call has already generated multiple copyrighted works today. It's virtually impossible not to. If you write a, a, a long text, if you write an email, uh, you take a few notes, uh, uh, you uh, send a video, all of those things are automatically protected as copyright in the United States. And so that means that there's an enormous number of copyrighted works uh, uh, floating around. Um, uh, on the on the technology side, um, uh, one of the things that we've seen in the in the debates over generative AI and copyright uh, is uh, some real misconceptions about how the technology works. Um, uh, my favorite is there's a sort of meme circulating out there that says, "Well, look, this is just a collage device." All AI does is it takes the things in its training data set and it pastes them together. Um, uh, and so whenever it creates something new, it's really just your picture and a bunch of other pictures put together in a collage, right? Your text and other people's text put together in a collage. And I think that, you know, that kind of misconception influences how people think about copyright law. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. So, um, I see as well, because um, interesting, whenever uh, like a lot of people on this program are maybe coders, and if you ever look at your contract with your company, you will see there who actually owns the coding you're doing, which is interesting. And another misconception I sometimes, um, I believe is a misconception, and I think you can correct me, Mark, is that anything a person creates is copyrightable, but anything a machine creates is not copyrightable. Is there any gray area there, or is that generally? Yeah, well, I mean, so we're we're struggling with that right now, and um, you know, there's a there's a case from a couple of years ago that that kind of made the public consciousness, and so you may have heard of it called Naruto versus Slater, uh, mm -hmm. and this involves the monkey uh, who took a selfie uh, that went viral on the internet. Uh, there was a lawsuit that went to the Court of Appeals about whether you know who owns the copyright in that uh, photograph, and the N Ninth Circuit said. Only human beings can be copyright owner, can create, uh, can be authors. Um, and so the monkey, even though the monkey may, took the picture, the monkey's not a copyright owner. They're not an, viewed as an author. Um, I think the copyright office has sort of looked at that and said, all right, if we think the AI itself is generating new text, uh, the AI can't be an author of that text. It's not a human being. Um, but things get a little more complicated because the, the, the Copyright Office says, depending on how that uh, uh, work was generated, if the prompts you made were sufficiently detailed, uh, if you went back and kind of uh, tweaked it to try to get the thing you wanted, there may be copyrightability in the, uh, in the sort of prompt engineering you engage in uh, that generates these works. But it is the case, I think, at least for now, the law says only human beings can be authors. Um, and so we're looking around for the human uh, touch in, in the AI generated work. Yeah, and I think we can we can delve into that um, a little more. But what's also interesting is um, this is, is very much a hot topic of debate. As we know, machine learning, deep learning has been around for the last decade. Um, other computer algorithms much more before that that have required um, this dependency on some type of training data, right? Um, so 
some of these issues are not new per se. And I know you've touched upon this a little bit already. So what are some of the new questions that generative AI and large language models are surfacing, which is different from say, what machine learning and deep learning were surfacing maybe um, five or five years ago? Yeah, and so I think I think the, <clears throat> the legal issues kind of fit into sort of three large buckets, right? One is, uh, is it legal to train my AI using copyrighted works? Uh, a second is, what do we do about the output of those works? Um, and the and the third is right um, uh, sort of who might own the the output the, the issue we just made reference to. Uh, I think on the training issue, that's where we're starting to see the most litigation right now. Um, and here we do have, uh, as you suggest, right? The, you know, generative AI is new, but the the problem, the issue, isn't new. Mm. Um, we've got a number of cases in which. Uh, in prior technologies, companies will uh, grab or ingest uh, right, the entirety of a copyrighted work in order to generate something from it. So it's how search engines work, for instance. Right. And there are a bunch of lawsuits about whether the search engine going through and uh, creating a temporary database of something to, uh, uh, to create a search uh, link is, is illegal. And the courts there say it isn't. Um, uh, Google's book search, an even more interesting example, because Google didn't just sort of pull things down from the internet. It actually made and scanned a physical copy of all the books in the Stanford library. Um, and the court said that was fair use uh, because in both cases, while you're making a copy of the whole thing, you're making a copy only behind the scenes in your uh, database. You're not sharing that copy with the world and you're using that copy to do something transformative and productive, something you couldn't have done without engaging in that temporary intermediate copy. Yeah, and I think that case shocked a lot of people, including myself, because, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, Google Books and you see something at 20 percent, I think it, there, there was some kind of rule around it. I'm not sure if it still applies anymore, but they would show 20 percent of a book or a work. And um, you get you could get pretty far into a book with 20 percent of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and I often um, tell people that was a good example around fair use. And it is interesting, the fact that you can fair use may seem I'm just using it for search books, but I can actually read part of the book, which um, may lead me to not buy that book. So I think that's why people are are somewhat confused by the result of that case. And I'm not sure if what that was, did they settle that case or did they actually um, did? Uh, yeah, so the process was a little complicated. I actually represented Google in this case. Um, interesting, wow. Um, so they, they tried to settle the case um, uh, and, uh, and then the court said, no, um, you know, we're, we don't think the settlement is kind of in the public interest. So it went back to litigation. And then ultimately the court said uh, that the use was fair. Although I will note that the, the, the use they said was fair was the creation of the, of the database behind the scenes so they could use it for search and the generation of just small snippets, right? Kind of search exactly. result type snippets. Um, the uh, the more extensive segments that the that Google Books offers, it offers either for books that are old, they're before 1928, uh, and so they're out of copyright, or they are books that the uh, publishers have uh, ultimately agreed and signed a license to. Uh, and so um, even though the publishers fought this tooth and nail, I think they eventually sort of figured out that, hey, this is a way to, to get people interested in and buying books, uh, even though they're living in the online world. Exactly. Uh, exactly as I use it. And, you know, Mark, I know you're um, doing a lot of work around uh, generative AI hallucinations uh, as well as, um, and we'll talk about it a little later, but because we're on the topic of generative, uh, of copyright right now, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, memorization problem. So um, to our listeners out there who are not familiar with that, um, I just started hearing about this uh, a couple of months ago myself. It's when the generative AI and the LLMs produce outputs, which appears to be a copy of the input. So they're memorizing the um, input. And again, as explained generative AI, this shouldn't be the case per se. So, um, so 
in, in, in that context, what are some of the challenges that arise when AI generated content resembles existing copyrighted works, even though that wasn't the intent? Yeah, right. So, right. So we've been talking about, can I train on uh, copyrighted works that's being litigated right now? But I think, you know, I think the answer will be yes. The courts will say it's fair use. It's going to be like a, a training, a search engine or a book. Right. But I think it's a much harder problem. Uh, right. If the output of the AI looks substantially similar to a particular copyrighted work. Uh, so I've done some work with a number of the computer science folks at Stanford uh, in Percy Lang's group uh, on this problem. And so one of the things we've noted is that it actually doesn't happen that often. It does happen, uh, right, uh, the, uh, that you get an output that's substantially similar. Um, when it happens, it's usually one of three things uh, uh, that causes it. Um, one is a, a problem of deduplication. Right. So it's, it's almost right. never the case that the AI is actually memorizing a particular work. Uh, what it is doing is looking to uh, uh, the several hundred closest works. And if those several hundred closest works are identical copies of the same photograph, it may generate a composite which looks very much like that photograph. Um, but it's actually drawing from a kind of bunch of different learning examples. We just didn't do a very good job of kind of eliminating duplication because it turns out technically that's much harder than it sounds. So that's one particular uh, way it can happen. Second way it can happen, it turns out that if you uh, uh, ask a very specific prompt, uh, you can direct uh, uh, ChatGPT, for instance, towards um, uh, uh, towards creating a very similar work. So in our paper, we ask ChatGPT to give us a children's story about wizard kids who go to a wizarding school, and it doesn't give us Harry Potter or anything much like Harry Potter. But if you ask it to give a story, give it a story that begins with, and you give it the first paragraph of the first Harry Potter book, it pretty faithfully spits out the next few chapters with only a few changes. And so I think the very specific prompting uh, to, to say, this is precisely the thing I'm looking for, uh, may actually trigger uh, chat GPT at least, uh, and the text image, text engines to, uh, uh, to give you a, a very similar result. Uh, I think that's less true in the image space because the technology works differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third category, I think, and, and this is in some sense the hardest one for copyright law to think about is, you know, the image engines come up with concepts, right? I, 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 I abstract away from things and I figure out, okay, this is what a cup of coffee looks like. This is what a cat looks like. And so if you ask it to generate a cat drinking a cup of coffee, right, it has those concepts and can generate one. But I think there are some things that are both concepts in the AI's uh, sense and also copyrighted. So think about Baby Yoda or Snoopy, right? You can get a pretty good Baby Yoda out of a, a stable diffusion image. It's not because it's memorized a particular image. It's because it's seen enough pictures of Baby Yoda that basically look similar, that it understands Baby Yoda as a concept. Uh, and so it'll, it'll give you that concept back if you ask it to. Yeah, so that that begs the question, of course. Though um, I think it was the second one you mentioned, whereas people are prompting for very specific use cases. So this is the question here: Who's, as I mentioned in my opening um, comments, who is responsible for that? Then is it the generative AI? Is it the uh, person doing the prompting? Um, any any light you can shed on that? I think it's a core question. Yeah, it's a it's a hard problem, right? And so, right, I, you know, I think if the answer is I just sort of type in an innocuous search query and I get uh, I get baby Yoda back. Um, you know, Disney's not going to be happy about that. And that's going to be a problem for the uh, for the AI company. Um, but I think things get a lot uh, messier if, in fact, it seems like I'm trying to prompt specifically for infringement. Right. As we did in this Harry Potter case with the text we gave it. Um, and sometimes it's even going to be the case, I think, that the AI will uh, refuse to give you something uh, because it's too similar to a copyrighted work. But then you may be able to jailbreak it. Right. To sort of right. Uh, engineer around that. At that point, it seems to me like the right thing to do is to say, well, all right, this is not an AI system that is 
designed to infringe copyright. This is an AI system that's being misused by a particular user to infringe copyright. And we ought to say that the, the particular person who is uh, who's doing the misuse is the, is the person who's responsible. We, we saw um, some we saw a similar set of issues come up in the early days of the internet, right? Uh, lots of copyrighted material posted by other people, downloaded by other people. Right. And the courts spent uh, uh, you know the better part of two decades litigating the question of, all right, is this uh, the machine that's responsible for this or is this individuals misusing the machine? And we came down on the side that, uh, that the technology itself shouldn't be illegal, but that particular misuse of the technology should be illegal. Yeah, This exactly. one's going to be a little more complicated because what we can do in the internet is Uh, the, so, uh, we can say, all right, yeah, it's on your site. You didn't put it there, but once you know about it, you got to take it down. You can do I something think. like that with AI, but it's a lot harder, right? Uh, we're, right. we're working technically on ways to figure out how to withdraw something from a training data set. Uh, but it's not, you can't do it retroactively, right? The most you could do, I think would be to say, we're not going to, when we retrain, we won't include this. Um, yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, yeah, beg a very expensive question because the cost. I know the cost is coming down rapidly to train these um, LLMs and other generative AI models. But um, yeah, if you spend twenty million dollars, you don't want to be just uh, spinning that up again. Right, and, 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 and of course, it's everybody. Problem. Right, it's, you know, each yeah. day. I mean, I think Google gets something like uh, uh, I don't know five thousand notices a day uh, for, uh, for copyright infringement. Right. So it's it'd be one thing to say, well, I'm going to retrain it once cause I've identified one problem. It's another right. thing if they're going to be sort of coming in every day. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, ton of interesting questions you're raising there and thanks for that no. um, insight. But I want to take a, um, a listener question. Rashik uh, Dahar asks, um, privacy laws are usually circumnavigated with consent. How do we make consent more understood? Standable by simplifying legally. So, um, and, and again, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but if you could comment on that, Mark. Well, right. And so I think one of the things, so in the copyright context, right, this is coming up as a, as a similar issue, right? And so in two ways, right? One is, um, right, should I have to get consent uh, uh, from copyright owners to train on a data set, right? That's not how we did search engines, really. It's not how we did the Google Book search case at all. Um, but a version of that consent uh, story is the robots.txt header. So mm -hmm. uh, a, a company like Stable Diffusion uses uh, the uh, Lion database, which uses common crawl. Uh, and that means what they're training on is not everything on the internet, but it's everything on the internet that has said, yes, I am, I am okay with robots coming and indexing me. Right. Um, right. And so you could, I think you could say, well, hey, wait a minute, those people have said, yeah, I'm okay with this. They've consented to this. They shouldn't be heard to complain now. It's a little more complicated because I think, you know, most people who click the robots.txt header are thinking search engine and not generative AI, and maybe yeah. they would treat those differently. Um, yeah, exactly. I was interesting. Um, I think the New York Times published a article on how LLMs are trained, and I think it was a Google model, it might have been Palm one or two, and you could put in your website there. So we've um we've an open data science blog site where we publish articles around um, you know, open source AI and whatnot, and we found out of uh, 15 million websites, we're number 75,000. And I mentioned to the team, this is why it's so good. ChatGPT or uh, whichever it was is so good. It um, uh, has the same kind of tone and uh, sounding on that. So, yeah, I think that's a very interesting point because the robot.txt, so if people who know that, um, every website has one. Um, and it's a catch-22 because, you know, when you put your content out there in the web, you need traffic and you need to be on the search engines and robot.txt is a way of doing that. But I have had, heard the argument come back quite frequently. Well, that was only for SEO. That was for search. That wasn't to take my um, take my works and um, you know mimic them, as I said earlier. So I think I think that's going to yeah, be interesting. Yeah, I, I think right. So you could imagine saying, well, let's we'll do a separate one for for you know AI and yeah. uh, uh, you know AI.text, right? And uh, 
uh, and I can pick whether I want that. So I think one, you know, one worry to me about this is I think these these models work well because they have a broad universe of the world to train on. Right. right. And so I, you know, one of the things that worries me about uh, saying, well, all right, you're only going to train on uh, a limited uh, amount of uh, text or images for which you've gotten a license is we may really narrow the, uh, the training data in a way that makes the model worse and also maybe in a way that makes the model biased. Right. So if I if, if, if I train only on Getty images rather than all the images I find on the Internet, my guess is that's got a different population uh, distribution, right? It might have fewer people from outside the United States, fewer people of color, right? It may emphasize some things and not others, and that's going to end up playing out in the outputs, right? So if we if we yeah. want a, a sort of generative AI outputs that are in fact, right, text that really does seem like text, images that are kind of what we're asking for, the best way to get that, I think, is to have a broad training data set. And that's hard to do if we say you can't do it without consent. Yeah, those are those are um, very fair points. So it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, balances out. But I want to go back to um, an earlier question we were talking about uh, misconceptions, because one of our listeners um, raised a good question around the disconnect between um, copyright and uh, patents, because um, those of us working in the AI space, uh, creating algorithms, creating code, creating um, workflows and systems. Um, not only is it copyright here, but also um, patents. And I, f- I kind of feel like in the conversations I've had, there's been a bit of misconception around what Gen AI means for patents and then the misconceptions between patents and copyright, if you can address that, which I know is a pretty big question, but. Yeah, right. So I think there's, I mean, right on the kind of, is the AI itself infringing? There's less of a problem of patents so far, although I think there will be, right? One of the, one of the big differences as a practical matter between patents and copyrights is um, copyright, you create something, you have a copyright in it, right? As I said, everybody's made copyrighted works already today. Uh, uh, patent right you don't get until you go to the patent office, persuade them that you've got something that's new and useful. Uh, that process usually takes something on the order of three years. Um, in the generative AI space, what that means, I think, is that we haven't even begun to see the patents yeah. that are being written based on the new technology, right? It's good, they're going to pop up several years from now, and by then the technology is going to look very different. And that's been a real problem for patent law in other fast moving technologies like the Internet space. Right. Uh, Patents can be very useful, uh, but uh, but because it takes so long to get them, uh, they're often sort of technology that describes the technology is obsolete by the time you get the patent. Right. And so then, then you see a bunch of people filing lawsuits saying, well, you know, I really invented this thing some time ago, uh, but, uh, you know, but, but nobody knew about it. The other big difference between patents and copyrights is that copyrights require copying, right? If I, if I make something independent, if an AI generates something and it didn't uh, copy it from you, that's not a problem. Uh, there's no independent invention defense in patents. So if you got a patent on a basic uh, uh, piece of a generative AI model, everybody uh, you're everybody's at your mercy whether or not they developed it on their own. Yes, very true. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, what are some of the legal considerations creators of generative AI algorithms, um, people listening to the show, should take into account to avoid copyright infringement claims. Has there been any much discussion around that topic? Yeah, and that is, I mean, it is the sort of thing we've been kind of working on with the with the CS folks, right? So one thing to the extent you can do it is deduplication, right? Anything that uh, that sort of prevents the uh, the duplication is a good thing. You know, that itself turns out to be a hard technical problem, right? Can because you define we, that a little bit for our listeners when you say deduplication? Yeah, so uh, so here we're talking about the problem of the same book or the same image showing up mm-hmm. multiple exactly. times in the data set because we crawled the whole internet and you know there are lots and lots of copies of this particular photograph of Messi out there or something of that nature, right? And um, you know, ideally, you'd say, all right, we're going to train on one and only one of those, so we don't kind of overweight. Uh, 
the results. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, one of the main reasons memorization happens. So if you can deduplicate, uh, sort of find ways to identify and filter out those identical elements from the training data set, that's going to help. Um, I think another thing you can definitely do, uh, again, at some significant cost, uh, is some back-end filtering. Right. So you could put a filter on the output side that said, all right, before I generate this answer, is it more than X percent similar to any particular thing in the training data set? The problem is it's that basically requires you to kind of rerun something each time it's done. That's going to slow it down. It's going to take more compute. Um, uh, and uh, so you probably don't want to do that all the time, but you might want to do it in response to certain queries. Right. So if you thought. Yeah. Right. Boy, uh, anything that involves a Disney character is going to get me sued. You might want to yes. sort of you know, be super careful if people yeah. are asking for Disney characters. The yeah. other thing you can do is to is to just not answer certain questions. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, you know, maybe you could filter on the input question side. Is this uh, does it look like the input is itself taken from a copyrighted work? So they're trying to prompt me to give a copyrighted work. Um, there are, uh, we'll see when we talk about hallucinations, right? There are th questions that chat GPT four just won't answer for instance, because it's worried about, uh, giving misinformation that's going to lead people astray. Uh, you know, I, you gotta, you want to be careful with that sort of thing because it makes the model less useful. Right. Uh, uh, but, uh, but they're all things you can do. One of the things we suggest in the paper is that. Uh, one of the, the one of the things computer scientists could do that would be very helpful to lawyers, right, is to sort of talk about technological solutions like these, their costs and benefits, and come up with a kind of best practices test. Uh, and then if if companies were engaged in kind of good practices, maybe the law could create a safe harbor and say, all right, if you've done taken various steps to try to avoid generating uh, infringing content will protect you in the circumstances where it happens anyway, because nothing's going to be perfect. Yeah. And, and those that I've talked to in the industry are definitely um, very actively looking at this duplication memorization problem, because it's one of the big barriers to releasing some of these more domain specific LLMs and uh, chat models. So I do see, we'll see, I do believe we'll see a lot of progress on that in the um, next uh, couple of months in the coming year, but you did, um, mentioned hallucinations, which is the flip side, flip side of this, right? The other side of the coin. And um, you have released um, a new paper on false speech, you know, hallucinations by AI. And that's a very interesting area of, um, of, of the legal domain. So, because um, I believe it was one of our writers was, um, yeah, it was a story on, uh, I believe it was a journalist in Georgia where they, OpenAI was sued for defamation after ChatGPT uh, generated a fake complaint accusing the person of embezzlement. That was a pretty famous case. I think it was a month ago, six weeks ago. So, yeah, hallucinations. Let's let's dive into that. And um, if you could give us a rundown of the main points uh, around this topic from your paper, that would be great. And then I think we can share a link to that paper as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, so this is, I mean, you know, the problem with generative AI is that it is generative, right? It is, right. it's not, uh, right, it, it, we, search engines are using versions of this, right? And there we can talk about kind of variants in the paper. We talk about a number of different kind of structures, but it's it's generating new new text. Uh, and so, you know, it's I think it's great if you want to write fiction. Um, it, it often gives you factual uh, information, but it isn't going to, isn't guaranteed to give you factual information. And particularly if you ask a question in a somewhat leading way, you can often generate wrong information. Uh, so you mentioned the, the defamation case that's been filed. There are a number of cases in which prominent people uh, have been falsely accused by uh, by uh, large language models of sexual harassment or being fired for uh, uh, for uh, uh, misconduct. Um, uh, in the in the course of writing this paper, my my two co-authors at the Stanford CS department and I uh, asked uh, what crimes we had been accused of, uh, and ChatGPT 3.5, though not 4.0, interestingly, uh, thinks mm -hmm. I've been 
accused of misappropriation of trade secrets, right? I haven't. Um, but, you know, I write about intellectual property law and that's a crime right. that does happen. And so you can see how prompting it, right, uh, with my name and, and crimes might sort of draw those connections. This is going to be, I think, a really hard problem for the law. Um, uh, we have a we have a law of defamation, um, but because we're concerned about limiting free speech, uh, we tend to make it pretty hard to prove a defamation claim, especially if it's a, a public figure, right? A sort of kind of famous yeah. or somewhat famous person. And the way we've made it hard is we've ratcheted up the mental state that's required. Right? If you just accidentally say something false about someone, it's not illegal. Um, you've right. got to know or have reason to know that it was false when you said it. Uh, and then the standard's even higher. It's kind of it's, it's willfulness uh, if it's a public figure. That mental state inquiry just doesn't make any sense when we're talking about an AI. I mean, the AI, AI doesn't intend to defame me when it says I've been accused of misappropriation of trade secrets. It doesn't intend anything. Right. It's not actually trying to communicate a message, uh, much less a message it knows or should know is false. And so I think there's a there's a worry, uh, worry, in my view, I guess you could think it's a good thing, right, that um, that there won't be any significant legal deterrent to this kind of false speech um, uh, because we have this state of mind requirement. Um, there are other circumstances. So one of the things we show in the paper is that even the more extractive models like the search engines are using uh, can can get these things wrong. So BARD, uh, if you ask BARD, uh, we ask BARD what to do in case of a seizure. Uh, and it went to a reputable medical site, right? It extracted information from that reputable medical site and it gave us a list, but it extracted that text from the section on what not to do in case of a seizure. Uh, uh -huh. now you can imagine that that's yeah. going to lead some people astray, right? Somebody could die as a result of that. Um, and again, right. So, you know, traditionally we've asked the question, well, all right, is there, you know, uh, uh, did you do this intentionally? Were you reckless, right? Did you take enough care in doing this, figuring out kind of how to translate those mental state questions into, uh, into a world where the just mindset, I think is going to be a hard problem for the law. Yeah, it's interesting what you, that last example you just gave where it copied the wrong um, or took the example from the wrong section. I'm surprised that some of these um, LLMs with their chat interface don't have more disclaimers and um, legally absorbed because definitely when you log in and um, you accept the terms in use, which is pretty standard for these systems, but I'm surprised they haven't added um, new warning labels on them yet. But I just want to get to, um, get to uh, fair use and transformative use. So um, because one of our listeners is asking, are there specific guidelines or legal tests that can help distinguish between transformative and infringement use of AI generated content? I think we've already covered quite a bit of this, but anything else around um, specific guidelines or legal tests? Yeah, I one of the problems with fair use, so let, me, let me say a little bit about the about the uh, disclaimer issue, too. I mean, I do think it's right that you know, if you go to Chat GPT, there's a pretty prominent hey, you know, there no. might be inaccurate information here on page one, right? It's not, as disclaimers often are, there's a link to somewhere that has a 50 pages of terms and conditions and it's somewhere in that. They are trying to make it pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, transparent. Whether that's effective or not in the law, you know, really depends on did people read it? Did they understand that, uh, that this was going to be a problem? Um, the, um, so on the, on the fair use question, yeah, one of the frustrations, uh, for anybody who encounters the copyright legal system, who's not a lawyer is fair use is not a rule. It is a kind of broad standard. It says, well, there's several different things we consider and we balance them against each other in a case by case basis. Uh, I think that generally, although not always leads to reasonable results, but it doesn't give people a lot of certainty. So things that you things that we consider, right? One thing we consider is, right, is the is the work itself transformed? Did I kind of did I make a thing that is significantly different than the than the thing that I started with? A second thing, and I think maybe more relevant in the AI context, is is the purpose different? Is the purpose transformed? Am I using this purpose 
this 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 uh, copyrighted work for a different purpose than the copyright owner intended it. So in my fair learning paper, I talk about the that as a reason to think that training AI is probably going to be fair use, right? The reason the LLM wants to gather all of the text, right, all of the images is not to express itself, uh, right? It's not to communicate that content, right? It is to try to learn how language intersects, right? How words follow each other in context, right? How images are created. Uh, and that's a fundamentally different purpose, just like search engines, the court said, were a fundamentally different purpose. The other big factor that the courts consider in fair use is what's the effect on the market? Mm. And here, I think the what they mean by that is, right, is the defendant's work going to substitute for the plaintiff's work because of its copyrighted status? So if I make a song that is substantially similar to a Taylor Swift song and people listen to it instead of listening to Taylor Swift, she's lost a sale. That's probably not a fair use. Um, I don't think that is generally going to be a problem with generative AI because most of the output of generative AI is uh, is not uh, substantially similar to any of the input. Right. So there's competition. People are very uh, afraid that, uh, you know, if you're an artist, you're, you're quite concerned that it's now uh, free to generate uh, uh, art. But if you're generating art that isn't the copyright owner's art, the law says that's OK. The one complication there is, right, I might lose revenue. There might be a market effect if we think there is a licensing market for training it in the first place. And that's a kind of chicken and egg problem, right? If there's an established market in which people are getting paid for licensing, then I've lost money if you take my work for training, but you don't pay me. But if there isn't an established market, uh, then uh, then I, I don't have any real revenue stream I would lose. And we're, we're kind of at a weird inflection point there where I think it might be the case that different uh, AI in different sectors have different issues, right? And that if you're training a music AI, it may well be that the norm is going to be, yeah, you go get licenses from the songs you're training on. Uh, but that if you're training a text AI, right, on a bunch of Reddit or Twitter posts, right, there's no kind of similar norm. And the law might respond to that and say, all right, you got to pay if you're a music AI, but you don't have to pay if you're a text AI. Yeah, um, very fair points and fantastic insight. And just on fair use and copyright, um, because Megan is a little broader. We know um, the UK, the EU, and many other countries are looking at fair use and copyright. And one of our listeners, uh, Jan Anila, asks, uh, if the models have scraped content from countries that don't have fair use of images and text in their laws, would that open uh, one up for lawsuits in these jurisdictions? Very hard to answer yeah. the question. And, yeah, system. and I think the answer is quite possibly yes, right. So we've been talking about fair use, which is a U.S. legal concept. Most countries in the world don't have a fair use doctrine. Um, uh, uh, many countries have or are developing uh, a, a specific statutory exemption for text and data mining for training, right? Israel, Singapore, Japan all have... Uh, exemptions that allow training. The UK is sort of has one under consideration, um, uh, though it hasn't gone into effect yet. Um, and so, um, so I think there may be other countries where you're fine. But yeah, it's a it is a, a significant potential risk, even if you're reasonably confident, right, that you're that you're engaged in fair use in the United States, right, that you could be sued outside the United States. Um, now. For whatever reason, there's more litigation in the United States. The lawsuits have come first here, although there's a there's a Getty suit against Stability AI in the UK as well. Um, uh, it may one reason might be we're much more willing to grant uh, damage awards in U.S. courts than than elsewhere, and and a lot of these lawsuits I think are not about I want my work out of the training data set. There, I want to get paid. Um, but I I definitely think that you know, you should be worried about the potential global liability, um, even if you think you're comfortable under U.S. law. Yeah, and I, I have noticed that um, the U.K. and Italy especially have 
impose some pretty stringent laws around that. But in the interest of time, I do want to move on to privacy and data protection. Because um, what we're starting to notice now is that we have these very large generative and LLMs that are, as you mentioned, Mark, trained in very large data sets that generally come from web crawl and that very well-known data set. But as we move to more domain-specific LLMs and more targeted LLMs, you are, people are looking at putting in data in there, which may have privacy and data protection concerns. So, um, yeah, if you can talk a little bit about the privacy and data protection implications from using third-party data to train these AI models, because sometimes this is internal data, but there are obviously well-established laws around protecting private data. But um, if you can talk a little too, privacy and data protection concerns within these models. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so let me first say I'm not a privacy expert, right? Uh, I mean, I, I know some things yeah. about this, right? But uh, but particularly not a European law privacy expert where a lot of these issues will come up. Um, I think one thing that's worth doing is, is um, thinking about uh, uh, some of the way the technology works because I think some of the worries uh, are based on misconceptions, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a... Um, you know, there's a sort of uh, one of the worries is, oh, generative AI is going to disclose my personal data. Uh, now, most of the generative AIs, right, are going to disclose your personal data uh, only if, right, that personal data is out there uh, in on the public space in the web, but, you know, with a robots.txt header uh, and they trained on it. And even then, it seems extremely unlikely that the AI is going to generate output that includes your address, right, or something of that, uh, you know, something personal about you, um, unless it is specifically prompted to do so, right? So if somebody wants to find your address and you put your address on the internet on the, on the public internet, I'm not sure that sort of hoping generative AI will create it is is uh, is the sort of most direct way to go about it. I do think, um, and the other worry I think that is probably a misconception is the, if I type it into the prompt, it's all getting sucked up into the into right. the training data set and now it'll come out as output. And I hear that a lot and that's just not how these models work. Uh, you know, it, it might be might be fun actually, right? If the if the model were retrained in real time each time you um, each time you type the prompt, uh, but it's not technically feasible. Um, you know what what happens, and I think the reason people feel that way is right that for that particular inquiry, we use it as part of the seed, and therefore we give you information that is contextually responsive to what you just told us. And so people think, aha, the model knows this about me, uh, when in fact uh -huh. it hasn't sort of learned that. But I think there will be a more significant set of problems, as you indicate, right, if we, as we start to move to kind of more micro training models, uh, right? So I come in and say, all right, I'm going to train, uh, I'm going to take my generative AI model and I'm going to fine tune it just on the specific information of your law firm or your hospital, right? To give you, uh, you know, better access to your own data. Now I am training, right, on specific mm -hmm. data uh, that may well be private information. And so I think we want to be extremely careful uh, in those kind of specific fine-tuned models as you're leaving the public internet and training on private data that, that you've given it, you want to be very careful in contracts uh, to make sure that that's not information that can leak back into, into the general model. Exactly. And I think um, a lot of uh, laws and protections around private data and in general software and AI can, um, can help with that as well and have. So regulation and policy, getting to my last couple of questions here. Any thoughts on how policy or legal, legal frameworks um, can balance the need between uh, encouraging innovation in AI while also protecting the rights of creators and original content owners? I know that's a very large area of debate at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, right? I mean, I think, you know, I think the answer is, right, we probably do want both in copyright and in something like hallucination and false speech, we probably do want a set of best practices, right? We want a set of things that people are encouraged to do not to make the problem never happen. That's never gonna, it's never gonna be right. the case, right? But to try to minimize the risk, to try to avoid uh, unnecessary harm. Uh, and so I think a useful thing to do would be to sort of come up with those uh, best practices and then create a set of safe harbors that say, 
if you're doing these things, you're you're acting kind of in good faith uh, to try to to try to make the world better. Then you're okay. If you're not, then you may face liability when things go wrong. I am I am worried that uh, we're in a bit of a moral panic right now around AI, uh, and that uh, the the push to regulate. Uh, may well end up being either a push to kind of ban or pause AI, right? We've heard those calls already, uh, or or just a kind of early and very ham-handed regulation that says something like, um, you must always tell us in your AI output sort of all of the inputs it was trained from, right? And that that sounds, if you know nothing about the technology, like a perfectly reasonable thing to require. And of course, it would be entirely impossible. Uh, right. So I'm worried a little bit about the about that. I there's a there's a great line um, uh, that seems to me often applicable to Congress. Um, uh, don't just do something. Stand there. <laughs> Sometimes I hope they will do that. Exactly. Um, so you mentioned there, it is such a fast moving space on both the um, policy side here in the U.S. and abroad, as we mentioned, but also on the uh, legal case side. And. I tend to think that uh, a lot of this is going to get flushed out in the next six to 12 months. So what are some of the most compelling cases around generative AI and LLMs that uh, people in the industry, the AI industry and other interest parties should be uh, following right now if you if you have any at the top of your head? Yeah, definitely. So there are a bunch of copyright lawsuits going on that are all early stage. Um, uh, Doe versus GitHub. We haven't talked about the uh, the particular intricacies of, of generating code, um, right. uh, but that one's going on. Um, uh, there are several lawsuits against uh, uh, Stable Diffusion and Midjourney, and I should note here I represent Stable Diffusion in those cases. Uh, we just got a sort of early indication that the, the court was going to throw out much of the case um, uh, in a hearing two weeks ago. Uh, Can you but... um, interrupt, Mark? Do you mind? Giving um, what's the, the exact yep. case about? Yeah, so those are these copyright cases uh, are mostly about the the Doe versus GitHub cases uh, is in part about the sort of output of of uh, of Copilot uh, and the code right. training. Um, the the stability AI cases are just about the legality of training. Uh, the argument is, hey, you you used my uh, images in your training data set. That's illegal. And I feel like that's though that case is a is an existential threat to the AI model, right? If you if you can't train, if 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 any training oh. is copyright infringement, that's a problem. Um, I don't think that's how the court will come out, but I you know, but uh, it's it's definitely one to watch. And then the other one to watch, I think, is the one you mentioned in Georgia about the defamation case, right? Uh, seeing how the courts deal with the problem of hallucination and false speech, I think, is going to be really interesting. The the one caveat I'll give you law moves slowly. All these cases right. are at a very, very early stage, right? Even if they don't settle, even if they go to judgment, we might well be a year or two before we have any kind of indication from the district court, a year or two more before any appellate court weighed in, right? And of course, um, that's an eternity in the generative AI world. Yeah, no, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And even with the um, legislation that will probably come out at some point, they'll be tested in the law course, and it could take four or five years for this to play out. And when you look at that timeline versus how quickly this space is moving, um, yeah, it's 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 going to be a very interesting field to watch. So, um, Mark, as we've shared uh, to our audience, um, and we'll put in the show notes as well, we have lots of links to your recent papers. And as mentioned, you've um, published a lot of books. So, People want to follow your work, uh, follow these cases. Where's the best place to um, follow what you're doing here? What I'm doing, I you know the my my website, my Stanford website at the law school uh, is easy to find. Uh, there are a bunch of links, and it, it sounds like it's going to be shared with the with the group here as well. Uh, but I'm pretty I'm pretty easy to find. Excellent, yeah, and lots of great reference there. And uh, apologies in advance, to everyone, that we didn't get to all your questions. But Mark, this has been an absolutely fantastic and extremely extremely insightful conversation. Thanks for taking some of your valuable time to join us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for doing it. Thank you so much. And we'd love to chat again. Bye for now. So everyone, that's going to be a wrap for our show today. And then if I can just show the um, last slide here. So as mentioned, uh, we actually have a 60% round ending 
for ODSC West next week. Um, so that's currently the best price. So grab a um, ticket for ODSC in person or virtual um, if you can't make it in person. But we are continuing to work in that conference. As I, as I mentioned, we have 50 or 60 sessions out of our 200 plus um, pretty LLM Gen AI heavy. But the good news is mostly um, hands-on. So it doesn't matter if you're just starting your AI journey and want to learn about prompt engineering and LM or you're a seasoned practitioner and need some time off from um, work and the family to get some experience on this. So go check that out. Um, a few people ask on, asked on the questions, um, will this interview be recorded and available? Of course it will be. Um, all of these interviews we do, um, these lightning interviews, are available on our AI Plus platform. Um, so some good conversations we've had over the summer and we have ODSC APAC coming up um, in a couple of weeks and we do have a lightning interview next week with one of our speakers. And as you can see there, um, lots of good uh, webinars on other topics if you wanna grab some of those QR codes. So thank you again um, and you can reach me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions to ask about this uh, show or feedback, just um, drop me a note in LinkedIn. I'd be happy to respond. So thank you so much and goodbye until the next time.